crawling into the recesses of Putin's brain is not something anyone can really volunteer to do. But nonetheless, it is likely that he would regard this as politically existential. Taking Crimea in 2014 was a massive boost to him, and he clearly regards it essentially as his great political legacy. The thought of losing it means that he probably would think that actually puts his future in, in jeopardy. This is a peninsula that can be isolated. This is what they're trying to do at the moment. They're trying to cut down to the south in order to break the so-called land bridge, the, the road and rail links that connect Crimea with the Russian mainland. If they can do that, and it's basically a toss of the coin if they can do it this, this side of the winter, but at some point they will be able to. Then all of a sudden resupplying and reinforcing Crimea becomes very, very difficult. And in effect, it will be under siege. So that's possible. The question is, what then What then would happen after that? Well, that's a really good point. Let's come on to that, because it would be a huge moment for the Ukrainians and a massive blow for Vladimir Putin. What would the wider impact be on the war? I think this is the thing. I mean, we don't know for certain. Crawling into the recesses of Putin's brain is not something anyone can really volunteer to do. But nonetheless, it is likely that he would regard this as politically existential. Taking Crimea in 2014 was a massive boost to him, and he clearly regards it essentially as his great political legacy. The thought of losing it means that he probably would think that actually puts his future in, in jeopardy. So, you know, the risk is that he would be looking for any kind of way to escalate. We worry about nuclear weapons. That's probably not going to be necessarily the top of his list. But there are other ways he could try and escalate. And also, it would be a very tough political project for the Ukrainians to actually try and assimilate these territories, which, you know, for a long time have been essentially ruled by Russia. And even before then, many regarded themselves as Russians, even if they were Ukrainian passport holders. It's a really good point. I, I don't want to say, would Ukraine even want Crimea back? Clearly they do. But given the huge Russian-speaking population, if they did take it back, how difficult would the government in Kyiv find it to manage? Well, again, you know, we don't know, but it's two points are worth making. First of all, look, there are also some people in the Ukrainian government who publicly will cleave to the official line, which is that you know every square inch of Ukrainian territory must be regained. But then there are others who, in private, are actually willing to say they're not quite so sure if that really applies to, to Crimea, precisely for this issue. Because, look, there is an expectation on the heart part of, you know, certainly the more hardline elements of the Ukrainian government, that those Crimeans who really don't want to be Ukrainian, well, they'll just leave. That may be true, but there's, you know, a lot of people on on the, basically, the, the borderline who are not quite sure one way or the other. And I was talking to an official from the Ukrainian Interior Ministry, who actually was saying, look, his concern is they'd end up with their own Northern Ireland. That essentially, even when they're trying to rebuild after this catastrophic war, that they might find themselves in the middle of you know, tensions between people who primarily think of themselves as Russian, people who think of themselves as Ukrainian, returning Crimean Tatars who fled after the Russian occupation, that kind of thing. And therefore, this might become you know, a, a huge drain on Ukraine's resources. So look, and although at the moment this is just simply speculative, because Ukraine is nowhere near the point of taking Crimea back, it's interesting how even in Kyiv, you can find quietly some degree of dissension over Crimea. Well, also, in the event of any potential peace negotiations, Crimea presumably is, is one of Ukraine's strongest bargaining chips. Absolutely. And look, here is a particular problem for the Zelensky government. You know, look, I do know that certain certain Western governments are, again, behind the scenes trying to indicate that they should at least begin to get their heads around the fact that it's possible that they might actually need to do some kind of a deal over Crimea, which doesn't necessarily mean keeping letting the Russians keep it, but it means you know something short of just straightforward, as the, as the Ukrainians put it, deoccupation, but maybe some kind of co-dominion or a demilitarization of it or, or just simply a, a new genuine referendum on its future. Because exactly, if Ukraine is to have anything that it can sort of deal with for long-term security, it's that. We focus on the military side of it. The point is, you could push every single Russian soldier off into all of Ukrainian territory. And that in and itself does not end the war. That just simply moves the front line to the national border. Russia can still regroup, lob missiles over the border and so forth. So there is a kind of, you might see, after the, the military site stage of the war is won, then there needs to be a further security agreement and Crimea might have a part in that. But for the moment, the thing is, Ukrainians, by a massive majority, do not want to see any kind of territorial deal with Russia. 
So again, things may change if this war is rolling on in a year, two years time. But nonetheless, at present, it will be incredibly hard for the Zelensky government to actually make any or even talk about any kind of a deal. So, you know, again, we, we, we're at this stage where at present, very few people feel they have any room to manoeuvre. And therefore, it all depends on what happens on the battlefield.